All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here we are once again with the podcast. Uh, this is episode 35. Um, once again, I'm Steve. We've got Anthony joining us tonight as usual. And Chris Leone is also with us tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about all the process that's been going on um, for Chris and the Turtle Room and Garden State Tortoise with Chris's move, etc. So uh, good to have you guys with us again tonight. You too, man. Good to be here. Woo. Good to finally be back on this. You know, I can't yeah, it's been time. a little more than a year since we've had Chris on. So uh, I, I can't believe it's been that long, but time really does fly when you're having fun. Yeah, or working too hard. <laughs> well, that you know that could be the case too. <clears throat> so speaking of working too hard, uh, why don't you just kind of give everybody just kind of a little snippet of what you've been doing for the last uh, about six months, and then um, you know we can you know get into more details as we go. Well, um, we've been operating out of. Uh, Central Jersey for six years and um, it just came time to you know we, we'd actually been renting the property for all that time and you know we got to do a lot of cool things there that you know most people renting areas wouldn't be able to do but uh, it just it came time you know we were ready to buy and uh, I'm always a pessimist my wife is an optimist and she kept looking at this house and this property and it, it, was, brand, it was brand new and everything and I just kept you know, saying, stop, don't get your hopes up. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And it, but it did, you know, it was amazing. And it was the very first house and property that we looked at. And when we came to see it, um, we only went to one other house. And at that point we, we just said to our realtor, like, we don't even want to see the rest of the houses. Um, and we, you know, long story short, put in the offer, blah, 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 six weeks of hell. And we got the house and then followed by six more months of hell. <laughs> just a different kind. Yeah. A different kind. And, um, we have literally uprooted every single species, every single project, uh, while adding more during the whole time. And we've just successfully moved down here. And I'm happy to say that as of today, May 1st, we are almost fully set up out there. There's still, I'm, I'm in the outdoor tortoise building right now, and there's still a good amount of species in here that really want to get out. I feel bad for them. Not that there's anything wrong with them. It's just I like to see things in the sun. You know, I like to see them. You can't replicate that no matter what. So um, we're, we're getting there. And thanks to you two for, you know, helping out. And, you know, you guys helped me dig the Blanding's Turtle Pond and a number of other things. And, um, yeah, you know, it, that's what I've been doing nonstop every single day. Every time the weather allows, I'm out there building. Uh, Casey's finally been cleared to help me, you know, do work now ever since the C-section. And, um, you know, it's – when it, and when it rains, I'm writing articles and back in the building cleaning up after everybody in here. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's amazing. I try really? to I try to make as many posts as I can, but I, I just I can't answer all the questions. I try to, but you know, and then some of the questions it's just like wah wah wah, you know, so I don't answer them. <laughs> but <laughs> what, what exactly does wah 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 mean? Well, you know, for instance, I posted a photo yesterday of the. So a bunch of the testudo ibera, the what, what we call the ibera Greek tortoise. It's actually called the Asia Minor tortoise. They were it was it was ninety three the other day, and they all chose this little strip of shade to hide under. You know, they had plants, they have the greenhouse, they have everywhere else to go, but they chose this little narrow strip to to get shade in. And I know why they did that, and it's be, it's because you guys know too, like tortoises and turtles, they'll they'll pick a small area so that they can easily move in and out of the sun with, with just mm -hmm. within an inch, move over here, move over there, you know, but what do you think some people had to say about it? You know, well, why don't you offer them more places? That's terrible. There it is. That's the photo, you know? So, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, they have plenty of areas to cool off. They chose that decision. I had a full conversation <laughs> with them. I said, why don't you guys come over here? And they said, leave us alone. Weird man. We're going to stay here. I will say, Chris reminds me a lot of the, I can remember when I was a kid, don't ask me why, all right, I'm not a Madonna fan, you probably have no idea where I'm going with this, but. Not um, knowing you mentioned a Madonna, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, I know, I brought that out of nowhere. Uh, I'm <laughs> just kidding, I'm a huge Madonna fan, whatever, who, no one cares. So Madonna <laughs> said that, you know, if there were 100 people in a room, and 99 of them loved her, and one didn't like her, she wouldn't be able to handle that one. 
And yeah. I think that reminds me of you a lot because I think you're the type of person who really has a big heart and yeah. really cares about what you're doing. And Absolutely. with the social media, it's such a necessary part of it. Mm -hmm. You want to educate people. Um, you want to get the word out and, and, and connect to people. And 99% of the time that could be positive, but that 1% really, really sticks with you, I think. Yeah, you more yeah. than most of us. I know that feeling, it's yeah. horrible, but I know you more than most of us. It really does matter to you. Yeah, it's it's tough to get through, you know, and we the three of us have talked about it many times and in the end it's just a comment, but it does. It it gets to you because it's like but I'm not I'm I'm what, you know? I'm trying, you know. Yeah, I, I put my tortoises out in 93 degrees in full sunlight and didn't give them anywhere to go, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm assurance but I'm an assurance facility, you know. It's like Right. But yeah, it, you're right. It is. <laughs> it's it's, you know, and it's it's stupid to focus on that sometimes, but it's just I want everybody to be happy. I want everybody to to like what I'm doing and be happy with themselves too. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, kind of while we're talking, you know, uh, you know, on that, you know, habitat providing shade, all this other stuff, <clears throat> this whole big move, uh, you know, getting to move to a, a new facility, a new property kind of has its positives and in some ways it's got its negatives. Like for instance, yeah, yeah. it's great to have all this space and be able to build some new habitats from what you've learned from the past five years and kind of make things even better Right. Especially as we're, you know, moving to, a, in some ways, a, a bigger operation where we've got, in some ways, you've got more species that can, you know, make you some money, which enables us to save some of the more rare species for our conservation projects as well. Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, moving to a new facility property with several hundred animals, What's the greatest challenge of having to set the entire collection up like that instead of ha being able to just slowly build out as you as you grow? The 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 trick of it is is, is managing yourself, you know, maintaining and thank 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 God for for Casey and even you guys. You guys have talked to me off the ledge before, you know, where I, where I'm like, "Oh, you know, because it's true. It's like, you know, you go to move and two, three days before we even moved, I'm putting all these animals, taking them out of the habitats that I already made for them and putting them in bins, you know, man, they got to travel in bins, you know, and it's better to keep them darker while that's going on. So they don't freak <laughs> out, you know, and you know, we moved in the fall too and we lucked out. We had a nice fall. It wasn't terrible, but you know, you still had those days where it was like, Whoa, it's, it's 33 degree degrees in mid November and we're moving right now, you know? So I think the greatest challenge is managing yourself, trying to calm down and, and understanding that, you know, in the end, everything is going to be okay, but you can't, you can't, it's hard to just lay down at night and be like, okay, I'm just going to get a full night's sleep. I didn't, you know, I was up all night. Like in case you'd be like, what's the matter? It's the matter. I'm like, well, you know, I, I was looking at these guys today and, and they really need to go into something and I, and I have to do it. And, and you know, it's the, the trick, the, the, the trick of it is, is you love them so, so much. You know what I mean? And, and a lo any kind of loss is, is a terrible loss, you know, because we're responsible for these animals. So when you lose something, you, you, you kind of, f you feel like a failure, you know, but, you know, again, I think the greatest challenge was, was, was managing myself and just saying like, okay, look, I have no choice. This has to happen. This is going to happen. And I can either let it consume me and, 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 you know, eat, eat away at me, you know, to where I, I it just kind of ruins the whole vibe or I can just go for it. And that's what I did. You know, there were days where it was, it's, it was snowing out a little bit and I, and I was out there, you know, I'm out there digging and, and, uh, and going at it because I'm responsible for these animals, you know, and, and there can't be, and, and again, I know I bring her up a lot, but I'm so thankful for Casey and the way that she manages us, you know, because, if it was, if, if she wasn't so supportive, none of this would, would even, even be remotely close to being done, you know? Right. So hopefully that answers that a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a, an important thing to touch on too, is that, you know, managing yourself is important because if you wear yourself out too much, well, then you're going to be worthless to go out there and try to build something out the next day too. Yeah. So <clears throat> really just kind of balancing. I can see how, you know, that balancing act was really kind of important. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely was a balancing act for sure. You know, and I'm not, I'm not done. You know, like I'm looking around this room right now going, Oh, those guys need to go out, you know? <laughs> right. Oh yeah. yeah. What's the square inside? I'm sorry, sorry. What? 
No, 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 please, please continue. No, I was just going to say real quick, like even inside this building, I mean, it, I've, and I posted photos of the um, progress. I'm trying to make legit exhibits in here. You know what I mean? Like not tubs, you know, and, and like with the angulate tortoise or Bosper tortoise enclosure that my father and I finished, you know, I'm, I'm leaning over it right now. You know, it's, it's awesome to see this species in, in this kind of setup now, you know? So what's the square footage of that building is what I was going to ask before. Uh, 1200. <laughs> right. 1200 total or is 1200 just the size or side you're in now? Total. The side I'm in okay. right now is half that. So, okay. Yeah. I thought it was, so, for whatever reason, I thought it was bigger than that. I thought it was, uh, you know, I thought, I thought you were more than, uh, than that, but I guess not. Well, I think maybe, it looks, maybe I am. <laughs> no, it's a high ceiling and there's no yeah. room. So I, I think it seems bigger. I mean, 1,200 square feet is bigger than my entire house, like a lot bigger than my not, entire house. Not, no, 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 Anthony. It's bigger than the living area <laughs> in your house because the basement doesn't count for that. Right. But my basement is the size of my house. So that's my turtle area. So my turtle area is almost as big as yours, punk. What? Sorry. Well, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. but can, can you set up an Aldabra on the floor? I could and keep nothing else. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I am an Aldabra. Hey, uh, that's right. If you were a species, you would be an Aldabra probably. I think so. I have a, I have a big nose. <laughs> and I drink through my nostrils. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things Anthony wanted to do tonight was just kind of, in some ways, uh, let's call it go around your yard and just kind of talk about, you know, Maybe each type of setup or even the different species I think Anthony was thinking about. And so yeah. as we're doing that, let's, um, you know, a couple of things let's try to keep in mind and bring up is talk about um, when we get to them anyway. Let's talk about particular challenging uh, species to design habitats for maybe or, you know, or talk about some of the decision making processes along the way, why you chose certain certain things. That way, um, you know, our viewers can really get an understanding of why we build things the way we do. Yeah. Well, I, I have an idea for how we can make it fun. Okay. Are you ready? And we'll get into more conversation. Believe me, the three of us, when we are together, there's, there's never a shortage of conversation to go around. So yep. I think the real issue will be how do we keep this to an hour or an hour and a half or whatever we end up giving you guys uh, today who are viewing. But um, I, I, my idea was this. Steve and I throw you – Species names. We'll use the common names so the viewers can can uh, can follow along, and then we get to hear from one of the world class breeders who has worked with the species we'll bring up to hear kind of what pops into your head first. Maybe like a sentence or two, like a word maybe, association. Yeah, like word association, except like sentence association. So maybe like one to three sentences about a species, and then we move on. Okay. Just to see if we could kind of hear from you what your thoughts are and really get a bunch of species out there. Um, are we only, only going to bring up species that I keep here or, or are we going to just any species in general? Well, first of all, too, one thing I've noticed, too, and, and this is not a bad thing. I mean, you have a really, uh, a really strong um, kind of key group of a bunch of different species that are that you have had and you that, since we've known you and that you will continue to have forever and and they're kind of like the cornerstone of what you're doing right there are also other things that kind of come through once in a while and things usually change and that's just the way it is mm -hmm. um so uh, i think it's it, i don't know exactly what you have right now but um it's safe to say the stuff that i'll bring up you probably have had or, or have had recently or do have right now okay so even if it's something you don't have you can still give us your thoughts we won't throw sure. well maybe we'll throw you curveballs i'm not sure do it but let's do it anyway <laughs> to make a long story longer yeah yeah okay so um are we ready do we want to go back and forth steve uh sure so we're just going to throw out species names yeah, yeah, and, and you can uh, chime back in too. But I, I think I think mostly right. we want to hear from the from the man. So yes. Yeah, so and are we going to throw him stuff that he doesn't have, or are we just going to talk about what's there? I I don't care. All right, let's have we, fun. We should lean towards stuff that he knows about. Well, yeah, him. he knows about everything. So throw him. You just don't throw him any like lizard species or like. A, hey, I've kept <laughs> lizards in the past. A rare species <laughs> of hornworm. Okay. Yeah, and I'm good there. Okay, number one, Gulf Coast box turtles. 
Oh, I wish I had the Jurassic Park music to cue. That would be perfect right now. <laughs> Gulf Coast box turtles. There should be a bumper sticker that says, my Gulf Coast box turtle beat up your box turtle. Okay? Because they are, without a doubt, bulldozers, bruisers, awesome, amazing. They don't get enough respect because they don't have a pretty shell and they're not like, oh, my God, spectacular. And, but they're, they're bulbous. They're robust. They would, they, they would eat you if they could. <laughs> Okay. If you laid down in that enclosure and cut yourself or something, they would just, they would devour you. And they're awesome. They're amazing. They're intelligent. And the whole, you know, the whole Putnamai <laughs> thing, I mean, I'm going, I'm going on. I can go on forever. Love them. Love them. I can't wait to go see them in the morning when they're out. And, so and, and, and there's, there's nothing more erotic to a Gulf Coast box turtle than a nice rainstorm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that's all about. Well, I mean, almost any box turtle, though, you know? erotic that's terrific great word choice <laughs> yeah erotic <laughs> oh steve you're up man that was really speaking, good see speaking of of bumper stickers and this goes right in the next species there should be a bumper sticker that says my wood turtle is smarter than your honor student oh yeah that would be really good uh, and so uh, yeah. yeah and so let's talk about the wood turtle and oh i I'm going to have to go try to pull up the picture of that stream that's out there. Do you have, do you know if there's a recent one on your Instagram or something or, uh, you know what? I, I don't know if I took a recent one cause it's, it's actually all planted now. Right. Oh. And I added tears to the stream so that it flows over different areas of rocks. Um, Oh, you took my advice. I did. We talked about that. So, but I couldn't give you the curve in the stream that you wanted. That's okay. <laughs> Next time, you know. Um, so let's talk about these wood turtles and their habitat, the stream. Um, and, and just so the, the readers know, we, uh, the Blandings Pond is right next to, um, to the wood turtle pond as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the one that Anthony and I went down to help build. And I think, dig, I should say, in about what? In about three hours, we dug, what, a 500-gallon pond or something between the three of us? We really, like, Yeah, I mean, thing. we just, we kept, we started talking, and the next minute it was done. <laughs> you know, like. Um, Speak for yourselves. I thought that was a lot of work. It was. I mean, oh, wait, Steve, I do. Do you have the photo that I emailed you? Can you show that one now since you oh, brought the, up landings? Oh, well, let's, uh, let's talk about the wood turtles, and we'll come back to that. Yeah, I don't have a recent photo. I, I should run out there and grab one, but ah, it's all right. Okay. Um, well, so, folks, just watch our Facebook or Chris's Facebook and Instagram for you know an updated wood turtle habitat photo. Twenty twenty six hundred square foot wood turtle enclosure. So, the North American wood turtle <laughs> could definitely not beat up the Gulf Coast box turtle, but it is arguably considered the smartest reptile in the world. Um, and I, for one, totally agree with that. Um, they are unbelievably intelligent. They cock their head and look at you almost like a dog does. And there are species that I honestly couldn't live without, you know, um, they, they've been a part of my life since I was a kid. You know, I, some of the ones I have, I've had since, you know, back in the day, um, you used to be able to, you know, I remember working at pet stores when I was like, 14, 15 years old, and my parents would take me to the reptile shows in Pennsylvania, and there would be captive bred wood turtles for sale. You know what I mean? That you could still buy them back then, you know? And then, you know, all that changed, but um, they're just an unbelievably remarkable species, and they are at home in cold weather, you know? Um, we, we know from, from there, yeah, there's a, a picture of two of ours. Um, the female with the yellow skin, we have no history on her, but the female with the red skin was a confiscation animal from uh, New Jersey Fish and Wildlife. Um, and that right there, just that di diversity is, is as simple as skin color. But we know that the one, the yellow one definitely came from out west, and we know that the orange one has to be from somewhere around here. Um, but they are, I can't say enough things about them. They're, they're just, they are a passion species for me. They're um, there are species that can basically be enjoyed, enjoyed year round because the males will breed in the winter under the ice when it's snowing, they'll come out in it. They do still go into a torpor, um, and, and go dormant and hibernate to an extent, but they, they're, you know, any chance that they're given, they're out. Uh, and they're just, they're, you know, you, you don't have to be somewhere warm to enjoy them year round or, or, and you certainly shouldn't bring them inside, you know? Uh, they, they belong outside in the elements, experiencing every little bit of it. And uh, 
they're just incredible. And building their enclosure was 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 an experience. You know, I mean, you guys remember the old one. That one was was pretty extensive in itself. But this one is, they have a um, massive pool. Uh, they have a thirty foot long running stream, so that there's always cool clear water going for them. The entire enclosure is, or entire front of the enclosure and the stream is filled with three quarter inch um, Delaware Riverstone. So the Delaware Riverstone is actually coming from the habitat where some of them are found. And um, it's, they're, they're loving it. They're, I mean, they're, they're doing, they're doing phenomenal in there. That was the first enclosure that I built. You know, uh, we, we literally unpacked and I went outside with a shovel and I, and I, you know, I had my mother-in-law order a bunch of wood. So I could start putting the fence together. That's amazing. That's so cool. We're having yeah. trouble keeping it to the one to three sentence limit, but that's I'm because sorry. I'm sorry. Well, we went to your wheelhouse first, so um, that's that's not your fault. That's, no, it that's is. Our it fault. is. I, I love them all. <laughs> I can I can help you with that. How about Mata Mata Turtle? They're cool. They're neat. <laughs> okay, next year. Definitely got picked in gym class. Last in gym class. No, they're really cool. I, I love those turtles. They're not my thing, but they are, you know, watching one of them eat is, is super cool. And if you want something weird and, and totally against the grain, get a Mata Mata, you know, they're cool. <laughs> Next. That's right. See, that was really <laughs> good. That's exactly how I envisioned it. Yeah. And, and it'd be easier. Oh, that's a good one. So let's talk about those. Can you tell us what turtle that is? That's a Blanding's turtle. It's about it is to, a Blanding's turtle. And yeah. it's another species that would make a meal out of you if they could. So, it's a heel nipper. Yeah. I, took, I took this photo at, uh, at Chris's old place, and it's one of my favorite photos. I'm waiting to, like, to use it in one of my books or something. Like, I really <laughs> love this photo. Um, it's, it, so I was there, obviously. I took the photo, and I'm watching this turtle stalk him and walk. Now, th that enclosure, do you remember how long that enclosure was? Because that's that sand beach that you had that's really, I really adding, long. I kept adding to that enclosure, so I yeah. don't actually remember how big it was. It, I mean, it's obviously nothing compared to this new one, but it was it was big. It was a very narrow enclosure. Yeah, really long. And yeah, this, really this long. turtle walked all the way from the pond. It probably walked 30 feet on sand to get up to you because it wanted to They're never food. full. They're never full. Those it things literally can... chased you around the pen. Yeah. And, you know, you can't really get the visual without seeing how long the pen was, but this turtle really did chase him from far away. And we see that with tortoises, but not with turtles. Yeah, they're the puppy dogs of, of the turtle world, you know. I mean, they, their personality is, is, is unmatched. It, it really is, you know. They're, um, I mean, they, they, they're a little bit different than them, but I, I mean, well, I, I won't give away any other species because you haven't brought them up yet, but they're, <laughs> uh, they're on par with, with or even better than some other ones. And they're another one that can just be enjoyed year round. They love the cold. They'll breed when it's 27 degrees out, you know, and they, um, the, the reason I added that beach was because that was right after I had gone out to Minnesota to do a talk for the, uh, their herp society. And the DNR took me out in the field to research wild Blanding's turtles, which was a dream come true because I'd never seen them before in the wild. And, um, you know, we, we for for um, for the better part of a week, we were out there researching them and, and finding them, and I got to see their habitat. And these things are constantly coming up on sandy dirt roads to lay their eggs. And I thought, you know, I wasn't having amazing success with them. I was having success, and thought, let me let me try to recreate a little mini sandy dirt road for them. And sure enough, a bunch of them used it. You know, that's so cool. And I'll say too, for anyone who's watching and saying, well. You know, my my map turtle or my readier slider or my fill in the blank swims up to the glass when I walk in the room and wants to eat. Turtles when they're put outside, if you don't keep your turtles outside in the pond, are are they behave much differently. And I love it because I, I really do love when my when my turtles hate me and they want to bite me and hiss and run away and all of that. Um, that's how turtles usually act outside. Maybe they're a little less skittish and they don't jump off the log quite as fast when you walk up to them. But for a turtle to actually chase a turtle, a, an aquatic turtle to actually chase you down on land for food, that's a really special species and that's a really special, uh, circumstance. So it, it, it's really cool and not something that you can compare to like, you know, the situation where you keep an animal inside. So. So have you added a beach to the new Blanding's uh, habitat yet? They have a um, beachy type area in there. That, it's like the embankment that slopes up towards the wood turtle stream. And I'm thinking that's going to be good enough for them because even after creating that beach for them, um, they, they still – they're a species that really prefers to go um, – uh, 
what's what you would call it to the highest point you know so some of them would use that beach but some of them would still go to the far left of that old enclosure just to get up as high as they could you know to, some of them would even try to nest in, in the middle of a stump they would have no luck but because they were up high so i personally think that they're not going to need a recreation of a dirt or sand road here i think they're going to use this embankment that goes up it gets plenty of sun uh, there's grasses, there's hosta, there's a lot of stuff growing over there. I, I think that's what they're going to choose. But I'll watch. If 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 I'm noticing that females are gravid and they're taking forever, then I'll whip something up for them. Right. Well, and your your new soil is a bit sandier to begin with anyway. Yes. So even if they crawl up there, they're going to have a sandy type soil to dig into. Yeah, I have a bromance with the soil here. It's it's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively easy to dig compared to... Yeah. You know, the clay you get, like, here. Yes. Although you do have some clay underneath that sand. Yeah, we do, but you get to a good distance before you're like, ugh, you know. So. All right, Anthony, since I uh, pulled that Blanding's picture up, I guess you're up again. I am up again. Okay. You're one of the few people who breeds the Coheelan or aquatic box turtle. Yes. What do you have to say about them? They're amazing. And they're another species that doesn't get enough credit because they're not – they're not shiny or glittery or glitterly, whatever, whatever, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're a very plain looking turtle and it suits them. Uh, their personality makes up for it. They are an extremely prolific turtle in captivity. There's very few people doing it, but the people that are doing it are, you know, I mean, from one female last year, we had 18 eggs, 18 fertile eggs, you know, so they're, they really are prolific. You know, I've got a female that's only five, six years old that one of the, the small female that we entered this year, she laid a clutch. She laid a oh clutch my. of eggs. I mean, the thing wow. is, you know, she's tiny, you know, and box turtles are supposed to be pretty seasoned before they do that. Um, they're amazing. They're incredibly hardy. Uh, even though they come from, you know, the, the one Cuatro Cinegas area in Mexico where it's hot, I can leave them out here in the 40s and they still come looking for food. You know, they're, they're just an incredibly habitat specific but hardy animal. And, they're an absolute joy. I, I've never, I've never had a sick Coquitlam box turtle ever. Knock you know? on wood. Yeah, knock on wood. You're right. But e even the little hatchlings, they're they're not really fragile. They're kind of voracious right out of the egg. So that's really amazing. And the reason why I want to ask is because a lot of people don't get the opportunity to work with them because they're listed on the Federal Endangered Species, yeah. uh, Endangered Species Act, and and that means that uh, you cannot possess them uh, or or sell them across state lines rather without a uh, captive bred wildlife permit and for a long time they weren't letting people put them on their uh permits so uh that's a different story for a different day but the bottom line is a lot of people don't have the opportunity to keep them so maybe they well, wonder what it's like yeah it's and it's cool too for for us as the turtle room it's it's a conservation based project because we're working you know very closely now with the zoos we're about to do a pretty big transfer uh steve should i say much about it or um uh, I guess you, we could talk about a little bit. Nothing's, uh, you know, well, I won't say specifics, yet, but. but we, you know, one of our males is going to go out to a zoo and another zoo is, uh, sending us a mail so we can mix up the genetics and, and make things make a little more sense. So it's really cool to be part of, of this kind of project and work with a species like this on this kind of level. You know, it's, uh, it's rewarding to say the least. So awesome. I'm a huge fan. Me too. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> they, they are they are neat turtles because you yeah. don't normally see box turtles with that much um Aquatic love turtle. of water. Yep. Although the golfies in the Florida's come close but they're not quite in the same league. Yeah. Yeah, they're cl they're close, um. close but <clears throat> All right. So and I, I'm going with this one next, partly because we have uh, we actually have a question uh, about this species, and cool. this is another one that we could pr Chris could probably actually talk the rest of the show on this one, and just by saying that Chris knows exactly which species. Yeah, right. <laughs> so Chris, um, the the user question is. Um, uh, one of our viewers lives in the Chicago area, and he's going to build. A, he's planning on building an outdoor tortoise pen for this species this summer. Tips. And are we saying the species? <laughs> I was going to let you do that. Do we yeah, have Herman's to? Tortoise, right? Herman's tortoise? That's right. Uh, and what does he want to know again? He's going to be building an, a, an outdoor habitat for them uh, this summer. He lives in the Chicago area, though. So, uh, you okay. know, a bit different climate than you have. So, tips. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know what rainfall is like out there. Um, Herman's tortoises do like rain. They'll come out and it just like a box turtle will, but they do have to, they can't be in a soggy situation or an overly wet situation. So um, you want to make sure if the area you're building the pen for them is, if it's not on a well-drained area, like a sandy, rocky type soil, build it up, you know, um, put the fence in first instead of digging it into the ground and then and build it up, add the substrate to it so that the animals can stay elevated um, a cold frame or greenhouse that I use in every single pen for almost every single species of tortoise, doesn't have to just be Herman's, will go a long way. You can install a, an infrared 250 watt brooder lamp inside it that you would use for baby chicks uh, for extra cool nights because, you know, Illinois is obviously going to be significantly colder than me. Um, but Herman's, all three subspecies are incredibly hardy. They're another one that it, it doesn't seem to matter, matter where they come from in their, throughout their geographical range. They can adapt, you know. Um, as long as my tortoises can thermoregulate through means of the greenhouse cold frame or just finding a patch of sun, they can, they will come out and they will eat when it's only 55 degrees. You know, um, they're, 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 uh, anybody who knows me knows they are without a doubt, hands down. There's not a species on the planet that compares to them for me. Um, they're my ultimate all time favorite. They're extremely rewarding and there's absolutely no reason why he shouldn't be able to successfully keep them in, in the Chicago area. Plants, you know, <laughs> plants, spirea. Hosta, uh, maiden grasses, uh, fountain grasses, yarrow, um, sedums, you know, that kind of stuff that'll grow in sunny and make sure it's in a sunlit area, the whole pen, uh, that will be well appreciated by the tortoises. Um, make sure they have drinking water. Herman's dehydrate very rapidly. They definitely need to be able to drink. And other than that, predator proof, you know, it's pretty straightforward and there should be no reason why you can't hibernate them either. You know, they, they, uh, cold is no problem for them either. That's so great. That was like <laughs> rapid fire, four minutes of gold. So you mentioned, oh, <laughs> you mentioned needing to build up their habitat because of um, potential, you know, heavy rains. Um, one of the things we've already had to deal with at your facility since the move is kind of a blessing that we had one already is really had some torrential rains that really started flooding some habitats. Um, Good because now we know where that happens and we can start planning. But so, you know, what's how did that impact your plans and what are you doing to um, prevent that from becoming an issue for future um, unusually heavy rainstorms? The problem, well, the first of all, the good thing for me is the soil, like we talked earlier, the soil consistency down here is so perfect for tortoises that. I didn't have to remove it. You know, my old place, I had to remove it. I had to replace it, make my own mix. I don't have to do that here. This, this literally looks like anything from a leopard tortoise to a Herman's and in between could occur on it, you know? Um, so that part was great. My problem is I made the whole European tortoise section of the yard, you know, the Herman's, the Greeks, the marginated on the right side of the septic field. And I didn't think of that at first. So what's happening is when it when we get torrential rains, it's just coming off the, the, the top of the septic field because it's raised and it's flooding into the, the testudo pens. Um, so what I ended up having to do was we, we did we dig uh, we dig 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 we dug uh, random <laughs> trenches <laughs> in and around the pens to divert the water, and it's worked. You know, it's worked beautifully. Uh, and what I what it also did was we we made some diversions inside the pens and then filled them with a couple of a couple layers of uh, the same Delaware River stone that we used. Um, the same Delaware River stone we used in the wood turtle enclosure, and it, it it's a nice it easily drains. But when you get that much rain, it sits there for a little while. So it actually creates little pools and drinking areas for the tortoises. So it is literally exactly how they would drink in the wild. Okay, it pools, it collects. The tortoises get to have a nice replenishing drink. They store it until they need it again, you know. And it beats having to change water dishes all the time too because they defecate in them, you know. So I actually created these little mini pools for them with, with by creating diversions away from the greenhouses and the water would collect in them and it'll sit there. You know, it'll stay there for a little while until it, eventually you know seeps into the ground or ev evaporates so really um cool. i can't yeah. wait to see it in person yeah it's cool it, it works out really nicely and you'll see it, it rains and all the tortoises they just come right over to it they soak they drink and then it, that's it they're good you know wow really really uh, uh induces some natural behavior that maybe they don't normally yeah. do in a water dish that sits there all the time right yeah it, yeah it makes them think more about what the weather is and more opportunistic and stuff like that that's mm -hmm. really cool all right, you want to keep this this ball rolling here? Sure. Spider tortoises. I'm sorry, what? 
<laughs> Spider tortoises. Um, I love their size. You know, I, I, I am partial to smaller tortoises. Not that I don't like the big ones because we got plenty of them too, but I, I do love the smaller fit in the palm of your hand tortoises. Um, then there's no doubt about that. Spider tortoises aren't beautiful. They're not my cup of tea, you know, they're, um, but, uh, you can't beat the face either. They're cute, you know, but, and I think, I think any of these smaller species are, are really species that a lot of us should be targeting. And when we, when we educate and we create awareness because yes, okay, there's a hefty price tag on them. You're never going to get around that. You know, people can complain about that all they want, but that's not going to change, especially for species like the Pyxis that, you know, really their reproduction is very low. Um, but it's a smart move because that's an animal that's not going to end up in a shelter. It's not going to end up in an ASPCA. It's not going to end up at, you know, the Mats Society where they're trying to find a home for it desperately. It's not going to get dumped in a pond or dumped in a field, you know. Um, you know, and there's more to it. You know, there, there, there are specifics that come along with a more sensitive species like that. But, I mean, you're raising a wonderful little group of them, and they're, they're doing great for you, right? Yeah, I absolutely love them. I have seven of them, and um, they're they're terrific. Um, I I think, and the reason why I wanted to ask you about them is not just because I like them, but because um, I knew that they're not your cup of tea, and I was wondering if you were going to say why. I I think normally a lot of people talk about them as like pretty pet rocks that just kind of sit there; they don't do as much. To yeah. me, that makes them exciting because when they do something, right. then it means more. It means like three times. It's like like I'm a baseball fan because I don't mind watching a pitcher's duel where like and there's it's funny not a ton I'm of baseball. You know, I'm not a sports fan much, but baseball I am. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm into baseball, and I, I I agree with that. There's that you don't know what's going to happen, and all of a sudden something major does. You know. And I don't, I don't necessarily really have a complaint about spider tortoises because they're inactive. You know, sometimes it's nice to have a species that's not trying to eat you like the Blanding's turtles, you know, yeah, right. and, you feel, and you feel like, oh my God, I just fed you. What's the matter with you? You know, that's just them, you know? Um, for me, it's the whole star tortoise pattern thing on a shell. It's the spider, the radiated, the Burmese star, the Indian star, the Sri Lankan star. Um, it's one of those things where the community in general is, is so obsessive over certain groups of, of turtles or tortoises that it, it just, it brings it down a notch for me. You know, it's kind of like, okay, it's great. You know, they, they've got enough attention now type thing, you know, yep. but then there's plenty of species that are unbelievably common that I, I, I love leopard tortoises. You're never going to get me to not, you know, but there's more leopard tortoises in this world than there are flies at this point, you know? <laughs> so it's <laughs> maybe not that many, but you know, um, <laughs> so th that's what I think it, it is for me is, is, is it's just, uh, it, it brings it down a notch for me, but again, it, it's not, you know, I don't not enjoy them, you know, um, they're, they're really a great, great choice for a lot of these people that are like, I don't know what to do. I don't have the space, you know, and, and maybe a tortoise that doesn't need that much, you know, I mean, they go, they go dormant, you know, the dry season that you can create mm -hmm. for them. It's kind of like, okay, see ya till I'm ready to see you again, or they're ready to pop out again. That, that's, that's great for some people that are, you know, maybe some people are more busy during the months that that would occur. That's the perfect pectoris for them, you know? Right. Right. So there's certainly a lot of attributes to them that are 100%, you know, a selling point on them. Right. Right. Steve, do you have another species to go? Of course. Of course. Of course. How can I not? He's thinking um, right now. So, <laughs> you, uh, how can I not? I'm trying to remember which one. I'm trying to decide which one to go to next. Um, oh, anybody else find this funny? No? Okay. I missed that because I was typing back. I'm embarrassed. We type to each other. Just so everyone knows, all the viewers, we do type to each other. Chris just let out our big secret. Pay, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, that's a Wizard of Oz joke. We do type to each other during this uh, using AIM. Yes. <laughs> Talk about old school. Age, yeah. sex, location, question mark? No, <laughs> no, nothing? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Here for hmm. So um, let's talk about the one species you have that's probably in one of my favorite genera, uh, the yellow blotched map turtles. You've got a couple of them right behind you there. Ooh! See if I I, I can see if I can feed him. Oh, feisty are we? You can see Anthony's reflection there. You can. You could before, yeah. Mm, handsome, always handsome. 
What is going on with this thing? I swear there's maps in here. <laughs> oh, you can see them. I see yeah. one. Not very feisty. Oh, this one always is, though. There we go. There she is. Uh, food's in front of you. It's, that's gone. <laughs> you, pushed it, you pushed it away. You pushed ah. it away. What'd you do? You see what you did? <coughs> well, they're, they're more interested in me, so. Yeah, I, 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 I noticed that with several turtles, and sometimes it's one of those things you throw their food in, and then they won't eat it till you walk away because they're too busy just being distracted. Like now, now that I'm away, they're finally realizing. Yeah. Yeah. You can see them in the background a little bit there, so. Yeah. Nobody uh, likes to have someone watch them eat, though, right? I mean, nobody likes to watch someone eat. Watch, to have someone watch them eat. Nobody likes that. I think I, I think I look great when I eat. I wouldn't mind when people watching me. Not, not with this, not with this mustache. This give, old. Give me a pile of crab legs, and I'll, I'll show you a good time. Not with this soup strainer. <laughs> I have to wipe my face after every bite. Just so <laughs> at me. Yeah. Um. I uh, I really like the yellow blotched. They're they're an excellent map turtle, and I've always I've always liked graptomies. I've just never been able to really go nuts with them. And part of the reason is because I'm not uh, much of an aquaculturist. You know what I mean? Like I I don't like to do too much with water or filtration or anything like that. And Steve's been my saving grace with that. Um, but uh, I really enjoy them. I, I and I of the graptomies, I love the yellow blotched. I love ringed maps. I like Kegel's maps, but one of the coolest experiences of my life was going with Maurice from the Turtle Conservancy uh, and Ken and Harkin and a couple other people to go snorkeling. Yes, snorkeling in New Jersey. Snorkeling in New Jersey. Take that home, chew on it for a little while. For uh, common map turtles, you know, uh, Graptomys geographica, geographica, and and it was it was unbelievable. Literally, uh, chew on it. You can chew on the New Jersey water. Yeah. Just kidding. Take that home, chew on that for a little bit. Tell your friends. Snorkeling. Oh. Snorkeling in New Jersey, and you can see it's clear water. I swear to God. Is that like, like what are the chances I might bump into Snooky? Like, where in Jersey is this? Oh no, no, this is way up north. More, just this country is where I am. You're, you're not gonna, no. You 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 probably get more of a southern accent than a New York accent up there. So the problem is, if I go with you guys and I take my shirt off and and all of a sudden, you know, you'd be a basking plant platform for the turtles. MTV's there, and they want to give me, you know, my own reality show, the situation number two, that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. How am I going to deal with that? You know what I mean? These are the things I think about. You make the millions, and you dump it into turtle conservation. That sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. You need another species. Yes. African dwarf mud turtles. How are those doing for you? They are. They're so adorable. I, I have very bad uh, cute aggression, which is why I always tell my wife she needs to take my daughter because I'm going to bite her. Um, I get that too. And, yeah, I, I, my, I feel bad for my dogs. I, I mean, I grab them so hard in the face because they're, I have such bad cute, uh, cute aggression. And I kind of have it with these uh, African dwarf mud turtles, these Pelusius nanus. Uh, you, is there any chance you could grab one and yeah, let me grab it in front of the camera? So I'll, I'll keep talking while you're grabbing it. So the reason I'm having him do this is this is an adult – turtle and it's unbelievable how small they are um the price has come down a ton and just talking about what's suitable as a pet and what what's a good idea to have as a pet there are so many species out there that just don't make sense that are so popular um and these things are just a dream with how small they are how cute they are um how personable they are really for an aquatic species they're just absolutely terrific and uh, this is a new species that chris is keeping let me get a uh, tape measure, actually. Great idea. So there's a new species that he's keeping that um, he hadn't kept before. Um, we had a conversation about it before he before he picked it up. So small, yo, is small. What is that? Three and a half? I I don't know. Yeah. It's facing the wrong way. Three and a half. Yeah. Well, Three and I'm half. trying to so show the viewers. A, is that the female or the male? I can't. That's the female. That's a fe that's an adult female. Mm -hmm. That is absurd. Absolutely and this goes absurd. this goes hand in hand with what we were saying about the spider tortoises. You know, they I mean they get a little bit bigger than this, but you know, this is another this is something that, you know, you shouldn't have to find a home for. You know what I mean? It's not gonna outgrow anything really, you know. Look it's, at that that's like a four month old red ear slider right now in your hand. Yeah. Fully grown. Four hour old red eared slider. They're pumping them full of things now. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> is it from Florida? If it's from Florida, that's yeah. a four hour 
That's a, that's a regular slider that hatched four hours ago. Look at how cute yeah. that is. Oh, my God. Hey, girl. I'm going to put it down before I bite it. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for, for uh, indulging us and in, uh, for for letting me make you get up and run around for me and, and entertain me. But, uh, yeah, I mean, a great a great species that a lot of people don't know about. And there's not much written on them. They're, they're really no. kind of new um, to – to her pediculture, um, I wrote an article for the Batiger magazine in 2015 about them, and the natural history portion was so incredibly difficult to uh, to research for because there's barely anything written in English on the species. I was able to find things from you know little little tidbits from like four or five six different sources, but um, the information was really lacking. And it's funny because it's not a species that I consider myself an expert on at all, but because we have something on the website that I wrote about them, I get contacted all the time about that species. It's just because we're the only website that has something about them really because, yeah, it's just so limited. So anyway, just wanted to yeah, bring them up. you're right. And, and you know, they, it's a shame because, like, you, there's, again, there's so little information, almost nothing on them. And people will go to research a small species of turtle or tortoise to keep and or small list, and they're not even mentioned, you know. Right. And it's crazy because because they, I mean, they, in my opinion, they are the smallest, you know. Yeah, and they're not they're not well known and weren't available, so it didn't make sense to list them as a possible pet. And right. a lot of the stuff, the resources that we read online is, you know, a lot right. older than a couple of years, and they've just kind of shown up and become a part of her pediculture in the past couple of years. So if you're looking for that perfect pet turtle species. The, the one issue is that they've been bred very, very rarely. So if you're going to acquire some, you're probably going to find adults and they're going to be wild caught imports. So just know what goes with that. A lot of them have been doing well, but people have lost some uh, due to, you know, uh, kind of natural issues related to importation. But um, okay. and, and we don't even necessarily know how rare they are in the wild either. They're just, you know, they're not big enough to be used as bush meat and they're just kind of looked past because they have no value to the to the people where they where they occur and now just now they're realizing that they can actually sell them to uh, hobbyists and are doing so um steve you got another one i got a whole um, list here so you tell me yeah let's uh, talk about the pad lopers we mentioned nice. them before in our in our prep little in our prep meeting so let's talk about the world's smallest tortoises it's something i would absolutely love to work with you know um I'm a big fan of African tortoises. They're probably, well, they're definitely my second favorite group of tortoises. And uh, I've got a pretty wide variety of African tortoises here, but that's something that is not. I don't know if it ever will be. Um, but they are, from what I have read and can tell and have talked to friends overseas that are lucky enough to work with them and, and our friends at the Turtle Conservancy, they are an extremely inquisitive, very interesting uh, and just different species group of group of uh, species, you know, they're uh, Just amazing little tortoises. I mean, I mean the, look at a male parrot beak tortoise, you know, uh, just how it's like I know a lot of people say about wildlife Showy wildlife. Oh, it looks like somebody painted it, but it literally looks like somebody was like I'm gonna paint this tortoise <laughs> and I don't know what colors I want to choose. So I'm just gonna choose all of these you know? <laughs> So do we have a, uh, can we pull up a picture of a male uh, parrot beak? Uh, I can pull up a Homo signatus photo, I believe. Prove it. It might take me a second here. Prove but. it. Prove it. Take a second. This, this um, <coughs> species that came up in our kind of pregame conversation uh, was thanks to our friend Kevin Minto who asked the question if there was one species or uh, genus that Chris hasn't kept um, that is obtainable and that word is used very loosely obviously Chris has the ability to uh, work with more than the rest of us uh, layman turtle folk uh, that he you know that he hasn't kept but would want to so um, that's something, Chris, that you don't have experience with, but would, would really want to. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, if you know, two, I'd say the two, uh, two types that, that I would love to work with would be, uh, the homopus, you know, species, you know, especially the parrot beak tortoise and, um, bog turtles, you know, that would be something to be able to work with them. 
Yeah, there you go. That's a Signatus, right? Yeah, that's a full-grown Homopus Signatus male. You can see the nice honking tail there. That's like as big as his leg. <laughs> there's and so much like us. There's his front. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry. He's pyramided. He's not healthy. Uh, these guys tend to do that a little bit. He actually I was just kidding. I was, I was kidding. I was kidding. I was just trying to be the one out of a hundred for was just for, your, for your Madonna. Bringing it back to the beginning. <clears throat> Over the borderline. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so stupid. Oh, Chris, Chinese box turtles. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Cora flava marginata. Oh, are you going to show us something else? Is that what you have your? Is that what you have your sprayer? You did you grab something else? I grabbed my sprayer because I, I got to get these bow spritz some uh, artificial rain here. I was um, going to I was going to ask you about them too, but now I ask you about Chinese box turtles. We can get to them later. Um, I love Chinese box turtles. They are probably tied with another species for my favorite Asian species. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason I like Flavo so much is because they are structurally and even behaviorally a lot like our box turtles here in America, which are the real box turtles. And um, <laughs> they're, uh, they're just, they're awesome. I mean, I, I don't know anybody. I've never met somebody who doesn't like a Flavo. You know, they're, they're personable. They're super, super hardy. Um, and, and they're just, they're, they're a joy. They're really, uh, cause, I mean, we all know a lot of the, the Cora species or different Asian box turtles can be very difficult, very tricky, very shy. And uh, the Flavos are here to tell us that it's not always like that. So, I love it. Yeah. So since you're already spraying them, how about the, um, how about the angulated or, or bow spirit tortoises? Let's see if while we talk about them, we can get a view of them here. Is that good? Can we yeah, see you can see one here? over there on the right. They'll come out <laughs> as it rains here. Um, those oh, yeah. tortoises are another one of my preferred species. Uh, they're African, you know, they're South African tortoises, which I love that group. And, um, they're tricky. They're not easy. They are extremely hard to reproduce, uh, in captivity. Um, very limited success. They're not that hardy. You know, I, I, I really wouldn't suggest being like, oh, that's a pretty tortoise. Let me, let me try it. You know. Um, because it may end badly for you. Um, but I like them a lot because they're very similar to Testudos, the European tortoises. And um, they're fun. They're, they're a lot of fun to watch. They're, they're very colorful, a lot of contrast, very bold markings. Very small, you know, nice, small, manageable. Um, come here, girl. I hate to bother you, but that's, you know, that's an adult female right there, you know. Pick her up with one hand. That's a good thing. And... Um, I don't, re I don't recommend them for beginners whatsoever. I don't even recommend them for people that are that have had a little bit of success with certain species of tortoises, like, you know, maybe Hermans or Marginateds or Russians, and then wanting to branch into something a little more, you know, obscure or exotic. I, I wouldn't pick these guys. Um, they just, they seem to uh, really, you really got to stay on top of them, you know, and their, their habitat is, is different. You know, everybody thinks, Everybody thinks Africa, it's hot, it's dry, and it's not. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of cool rains that come, and you know, it could be part of the reason why we're not having that much success breeding them. But we do get a lot of eggs from them um, relative to the, to the amount of females that we have. And uh, I'm happy to say that I did successfully hatch one, but I'm sorry to report that it only lived 48 hours before it died. Um, and we're, I'm still trying to work that one out. I'm trying to plug away for information. I'm trying to talk to a lot of different people because I've got the group established. I got them reproducing. They're healthy. They will eat right out of my hands, but the right. egg situation. Well, you, you know. know, I think one of the important things to remember is they're from the Southern tip of Africa mm -hmm. and the Southern tip of Africa. You're talking, uh, you're talking, they're far enough away from the, 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 um, the equator that they're, they're nothing even close to being a tropical animal. Like, Right. As far as temperatures go, they, they might be the closest thing as far as a climate to what like a native tortoise might be like if we had one in our area. Yeah. yeah. 
because we get some of those cool rains in the spring and the fall and and whatever else. So yeah. it might be wise to try setting them up outside. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it easy, guys. Let's not make <laughs> any sudden movements here with these guys, okay? Please. Take it easy. Trying to give me a heart attack over here? Jeez. They're beautiful, though. You know, on the, live, that, on huh? the live broadcast, no less, we're doing this. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, it's, they got some interesting markings real quick before we move on here. You know, I mean, so, you know, that's the typical carapace. And then you flip them over. It's red. Really nice. Yeah. Really, really, really unique. Uh, really unique species. Very cool. They joust with those Guler scoots there, where they get the name Bowsprit. And I'm gonna put her back because she's very upset. Here we go. Poor lady. <laughs> Poor lady. Goodbye, my love. <laughs> Sorry, dumb and dumber. I got it. How I about? How about uh, Egyptian tortoises? Well, you're getting into my favorite group of tortoises, which is the testudos, the European. I'm not, I'm not jumping right in. Well, that's right, because they're from Africa, but they're a testudo. I'm trying uh, to dance around it a little bit. I know you are. Uh, I love Egyptian tortoises. They're, they're again, <laughs> touching on that small species that goes hand in hand with the African dwarf mud turtle and the spider tortoises and even these guys. Uh, Egyptian tortoises, despite their critical endangered status, they do they are produced very well in captivity and they tend to do pretty well for people. You know, I, I've, I'm happy to say I've never lost one. Um, you know, we got, we got two different groups of adults here. They're very easy to maintain. They really are. I'd have to say at least for the Northeast or most of the United States, they really are an indoor tortoise, you know? Um, and that's my article on them for reptiles magazine came out last month or a month before that, and that, you know, the, it was titled, you know, the perfect indoor tortoise because that's, you know, they can be kept in these designer cages and they only grow to be four inches. The males are t technically smaller and, um, the, you know, they're, they're definitely with proper lighting and, and substrate and keeping them dry, you know, but still having an area to drink and they're a joy, you know, they, they, they have little personalities on them. They're not, I don't consider them shy at all. I like them. I like no. them a lot. <laughs> you you me right back with a dumb and dumber. That was perfect. <laughs> Tractor beam sucked me right in. Yep. So we uh, haven't necessarily gotten to to this yet, but maybe it's one of the species we've already talked about. Um, as you've been building all these new enclosures here at um, new facility, which uh, species provide um, you know has the most difficult requirements for you to to meet when you're building a new enclosure, and you know. So, uh, you know, figure out what that species is and let's talk about that species in their habitat. So are you talking about a, a maintenance? Well, I, you know what? I'd have to say hands down. Well, that's a really good question. I'm going to go with the wood turtle enclosure, not because wood turtles are difficult to keep here. It's, they do a lot of the work on their own. You know, they, they go, this is their normal natural cycle here, winter, spring, summer, fall. They know what to do. You don't have to do anything for them. Um, but building that kind of enclosure, I mean, it's, it's, it's extensive. And it's, it's, I, I was, I live in the Southern New Jersey Pine Barrens on the coast and I created, a, I needed to create a mountain stream, a mountain spring, cool running water, um, the whole, everything from the stone to the plant life to the logs and, and just trying to give these turtles a, a pristine water source, that was the most difficult thing to capture because I had danced around it all these years, keeping them going back to my parents' house. You know, we had wood turtles growing up, you know, and, and my parents agreed to have a pond built for our turtles. It was just a simple pond with a waterfall. And wood turtles are adaptive. They did okay. You know, we didn't lose them or anything, but they didn't reproduce well. They, they, didn't, they didn't have the right habitat. And over the years, I've tried to master that. And I think I, I would like to be able to say I'm proud and, and that I have finally done it. And, um, but it, it, that was, I mean, I, I actually like stuttering thinking about the amount of work that's gone into that enclosure. And I'm still not done with it. I'm still every day adding plants finding areas where gravel has slipped or bottomed out and needs to be replaced. If there's any exposed line or is the pump to the stream clogged because I got to make sure that that stream is always going. It's got to always, always go. 
Um, you know, I, I would, and just the, again, the sheer size of it, 26, 2,600 square feet. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot to, to handle, but it's worth it, you know, but I, yeah, I'd have to say hands down. I was, that's the most difficult one, you know, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not as, it's not like going in there and grabbing a water bowl and cleaning it out. Luckily the, you know, the, the pond and the stream and everything don't have to be cleaned, but it, they have to be maintained, you know? So I want to ask you a question that, um, I want to apologize first because this is, this is going to get a little deep and, and I didn't prep you for this one. So get ready. Okay. Uh, you sell animals, right? Um, I, it hurts just to say it because I know how I already know the answer to this question, but can you talk a little bit about what that is like for you and um, what kind of you feel that you owe to the animals because of that? And like, like, your feelings towards towards that whole process in general. Well, let me first start by saying that uh, thanks for doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that this I'm is totally uncomfortable. Kidding. I'm totally, I'm, well, no, you know, here's the thing. I know this is uncomfortable. But, no, no, it's it's really. You're, I, you're the greatest. To. You're the greatest, and there's a reason why. And I, yeah. I'd like people to hear this, even though it's a little deep for just kind of general type of conversation that you would want to have in front of our audience. I think that you know, it's what separates you from a lot of people. And it's, it's, it gives me some hope for the future of, yeah. of turtles and turtles in captivity and turtles in herpeticulture and all that type of stuff. So please, I'll leave you alone now. I, I, um, first, you know, let me say that, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with, with, with what anybody does. Like I, we, you know, we all have a lot of friends in this hobby industry, whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, and, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad, you know, collectively we stay away from the bad, you know, we know the good ones from the bad ones. We know the ones that, well, I probably can't trust that one, you know, but, um, there is a lot of good. There's a lot of honest, hardworking people that, that are just like, look, like I, I love these animals. I produce them and I want to be able to offer them to people. I feel like everybody should be able to enjoy them. Now I, I, I'm like that to an extent, you know, I do feel that anybody should be able to with, with under the right intentions, should be able to enjoy these animals, okay? Responsibly, uh, passionately, nothing less than passionately, okay? This is not a group of animals that you get just because you, want, you when the novelty wears off, it wears off, okay? We're talking about the most endangered group of vertebrates on the planet. We're talking about some of the most long-lived animals on the planet, and we owe it to them to, if we're going to take the step to be responsible for them, then, then damn it, 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 be responsible and stay that way. They're not disposable. They never will be. Okay. And that, that, that goes from to red-eared sliders to plowshare tortoises. Okay. All the two yeah. complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Either one of them deserves a shot at life. Okay. And an equal shot where I stand, I sell these animals because I have to. And the reason I have to is because I made a vow a very long time ago that my life was going to be completely inundated and surrounded by turtles and tortoises. I was going to dedicate my life to them and I was going to do whatever it took to live with them, share everything with them, share them with the world, all while being able to feed my family and keep a wonderful roof over their heads. All right. But that comes with a lot of boundaries, a lot of fine lines and a lot of, uh, seesawing okay because my passion is 100 percent with conservation okay i don't take turtles from the wild i don't want anybody to take turtles from the wild okay so that being said everything is moving forward 110 percent captive bred and captive bred only okay i'm not a dealer i don't buy animals to flip them i work my ass off to produce what i produce and only work with other people that are producing themselves um so that if I, if there's somebody that's like, Chris, I really want to get this. I know you don't work with them, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we obviously, we all have friends that we know, okay, the, this animal was born. This was the first thing that this animal saw was this person, you know? So by being able to sell these animals, I'm able to be with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's the only reason why I'm able to do it. I can say that my life is 100% dedicated to them. Casey and I live our lives around them, with them for them and it's all because of what i'm able to do with them but go on my website you won't see anything for sale because you have to do the work 
I want you to work for it, okay? And I describe that on, under my available section. People go to the available section thinking that there's going to be a list of turtles and tortoises for sale. They're not products, so I don't put them on there as such, okay? I want people to read, and then people come to me. I actually, just before I signed on to this, a woman said she was looking for a turtle for her family, wanted to know what to get. I sent her to the Turtle Room website. I said, check out our educational website first. I want you to do some research. Don't let me tell you. You can read. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got Google. Okay, Re and then come back to me and I'll help you fine tune it. Okay, hopefully it's something that I breed. And if it's not, I will, I'm not going to send them to somebody that's, that's got, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So with that, there's a lot of homework involved. There's a lot of extra work involved. There's a lot of back break to it. There's a lot of denying people. Okay. There, there, there's, you know, when somebody just wants to buy something to have it and it's either going to come right back to you, or it's going to end up at. You know, it's going to end up with Katrina and Matt's or something like that. And then they're, they're going to be looking for a home for it. Just one example, one of the many examples. So, again, I do it because I have to. It's a, I, I love my job. It's wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for the world. What I get to do every single day, I, I keep feeling like it's too good to be true, to be honest. But I have to do it the way I do it. And, and I, I would like to think that I can say that I am 100% – you know, confident that, that I'm doing it for the right reasons, you know, and I'm involved in a lot of different, um, conservation projects, you know, with the Coheal and box turtles, the Cora Beretti, you know, that's Smithsonian Institute, all the different stuff that we're doing, you know, the genetic products projects that I've done. I'm not sitting here just dishing turtles and tortoises out. I'm doing all the work in between. I'm writing the articles and I'm, I'm writing, you know, for reptiles magazine because I want people to understand what they're getting themselves into. You know, and, and what are the right species? You know, like, like the Egyptian tortoise article. Yeah, you're going to pay a lot of money for them, but they're, they're, they're the smarter choice, not the $5 red eared slider. The, mm -hmm. the, you know, $500 Egyptian is, is the better choice. You know, you got no problem spending $1,000 on a 72 inch plasma screen TV or more than that. I don't even know what they're going for. Well, you got to make that kind of investment in an animal too, you know unfortunately, because they're rare and, and people are putting the work into it. You know, the, just the enclosures and the, and the maintenance that goes into maintaining them, that's what makes these price tags high. But the price tags also <laughs> protect the animals. You know, the price, price tags protect them from ending up in a poor situation. There's another side to that, we obviously know, with the smuggling ring and all that stuff. But, you know, from my standpoint, hopefully that sums it up a little bit, you know. Yeah, it's really good. And obviously your passion shines through. I think Another way to, to illustrate this is you don't sell sulcatas at um, uh, at shows or things like that if you're if wow. you're if you're out and vending and and um, I've been there before with you and and we'll try to help and educate people and you know they could they'll pick up a sulcata tortoise somewhere for like sixty bucks right. when when you've got Ibera Greek tortoises for eighty bucks and it's like listen you know we're in Pennsylvania right now. You could keep these Ibera Greek tortoises their entire lives outside if you want to. And, you know, people are still choosing to buy the sulcata because it's $20 cheaper or because it's cuter or whatever. And, right. and people just just don't seem to um, don't seem to, to understand that, that there's a smarter choice out there. But, but you don't sell sulcatas for that reason. No, you know, I, I, I don't sell sulcatas. I don't sell red eared sliders. And that goes for all the red eared slider morphs, too. You know, they're all red eared sliders. So, um, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with it, but I, again, I don't want anybody to think that like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of our friends that are great guys that, that do things a little bit differently and that's fine. That, that's okay. I, I'm not judging anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but this is just the way that I have to do it. You know, if I could, if I could just be here every single day working with these animals, producing them and, and, you know, mother nature would cut me a paycheck every week and I don't have to ever send, you know, I could just give these animals to, to people. And, you know, we do that. We, there's a lot of giveaways too, you know, between close friends and staff members and everything like that. But, you know, it, it's just, it's a thing that has to be done. But I'm also smart with the conservation projects. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people come to me asking me if I'm going to have Cora Beretti for sale. You know, I may hatch them, but the they're, they're going to stay with us they're, they're, or they're going to be entered into the SSP and, and we're going to build things that way. It's the same thing with the Coheelans. You know what I mean? The, the, it, and those are just two projects, for example. You know what I mean? When Chris says SSP, just so all the viewers know, that's the Species Survival Program or Species Survival Plan that's mm -hmm. a part of the uh, Association of Zeus and Aquarium. So um, that's kind of a, a newer age version of, of what's referred to as a stud book where, um, you know, genetic uh the 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 genetic strength of a pairing is 
of a potential like mating pair is uh, used in determining which animals should be put together. And uh, it also keeps track of the population and things like that. So it's an official breeding program for endangered species through the, through the AZA. And uh, we're involved in, in those, and, and Chris is uh, directly involved in those. And Chris actually runs, runs his own stud book as well. It's Which most of our viewers know, but yeah. yeah. Oh, well, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I would think most of our viewers know at this point, you know, about the Western Hermans program. Well, that, you know, the Western Hermans, to touch on it real quick, it's a, it's a, it's a prime example of, um, of doing something responsible because that's a species that, you know, was really put on the map after all the things that we did for them. They were un totally misunderstood. You know, they've been, they're still attempting to elevate them to species level because of how different they are from the Eastern. And they're a rare, small, very manageable, beautiful tortoise. So by, by breeding them and offering those publicly and, ha and, and having a stud book that people can choose to partake in, you're offering an animal again that's not going to end up in a shelter, that's not going to just be dropped on somebody's doorstep. It's tiny, it's pretty, it's got a price tag on it, and the money that comes in from the two goes right back into this. I couldn't build these kinds of enclosures for everybody if we weren't doing things that way, you know? And, th and that, that's what helps me to sleep at night. It's like, okay, I took these animals in and, and look how they're getting to live now, you know? Which, that that's, means the most to me. That's a really good point. Steve, put it on the poll for our viewers. Did you know about the Herman's Tortoise Stud Book. <laughs> the Western Herman's Tortoise Stud Book. We'll put it on the poll. We want to hear from you, our viewers. Let us know. I'm just kidding. We don't do polls. That's, that's out of our technology. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't, I didn't know we did those. But I, didn't know we got, I don't think there's a way to do those through YouTube's comment section. So. Well, there ought to be, and I'm going to make a comment to YouTube about that. <laughs> I, want to, I want to speak to Mr. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me? YouTube? Are you there? Speaking of YouTube, we've got a few videos coming up that I wanted to plug. Um, on May 8th, we will be releasing a video on the Beardsley Zoo and their uh, project keeping and breeding the spotted turtle, Clemmie's Gutata. We're really excited about that. And there's some passionate young zookeepers there who are doing some amazing work uh, there is to, a, there to is set a, up that species. There is a um, AZA spotted turtle uh, SSP slash stud book uh, actually as well. So um, it's another species with a collaborative program for the species survival. Oh, everyone knew that, Steve. I'm just kidding. I can't even say that without smiling. <laughs> <laughs> On May 15th, we'll have the third installment of our uh, Crutchfield conversations, uh, the, the interviews with Tom Crutchfield, which, have been, which, which was just a joy to be a part of, and it's been great to see them again. Uh, on the little screen, uh, the opposite of the big screen. And uh, on May 22nd, we will have a really exciting video that we're going to be uh, releasing uh, on the um, really tremendous efforts of Jack Berlin uh, in Tampa, Florida, as he tries to work to create a, a really exciting uh, conservation project for the ornate diamondback terrapin. Uh, so we look forward to those three videos, which will be released every Monday, every Monday evening for the next three weeks. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> um, another thing to, to just kind of keep watching for within the next few weeks or a couple months, we will hopefully be making an announcement about another in situ conservation project that the turtle room is going to be taking a significant part in. That's right. Um, so just kind of keep your eyes open for that. We'll make um, it known. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, big gulps, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, see you later. <laughs> I'm also hoping um, – to uh, do some major updating to the projects section <laughs> on our website over the next several months. Um, we'll obviously announce when that's kind of happened so you guys know to go check those out as well. Check them out. Um, before we uh, wrap up, we do have another uh, viewer question. Yes. Um, so you talked about how well wood turtles and blanding turtles handle the cold weather. And so we've got a viewer that's, that's asking, how do they handle warm weather? How uh, important is the cool f for them to be able to flourish? Well, the, 
the general consensus with it is people that have tried to breed them down south have either had no luck at all or they've had to make some serious modifications uh, and additions. Uh, you know, for example, you know, um, I have a friend in Florida who, after several attempts to breed wood turtles, he, he decided to send them back up here or up here rather uh, to where they quote unquote would belong in, in this kind of annual cycle where they could experience a, you know, a, a winter, spring, summer, and fall. And they're already after just a short period of time doing better. Um, a lot of people just, they, they just can't handle it. They perish uh, or they're getting absolutely nothing out of them in terms of egg production. Uh, the males are, aren't even interested in breeding. Um, and the, the thing of it is, you know, Wood turtles and Blanding's turtles, they reach a peak breeding in the fall and they do it even in, into the winter. And um, when it's hot, they absolutely have to be able to get out of the heat. And that is, that is through means of vegetation, brush, uh, pine needles, leaves, and even deep water. Real quick example, going back to when I was in Minnesota with the DNR looking for Blanding's turtles, you would get in the water, okay? And even in Minnesota in the, in the summer, it's hot. So it'd be 85 degrees out. You would get in the water to go after a turtle and the surface of the water would be significantly warm, you know, like you were in like almost like a hot tub, but just, just a foot below that it was, I mean, cold, you know, they were able to get out of this, uh, get into vegetation, get, get into the muck. So I think as long as you can provide them with a very easy, easable, uh, easy refuge or a way to escape it, you're technically okay. I personally, after working with and breeding these two species since I was about nine. I'm 34 now, so do the math. Um, I don't think they belong in overly warm climates. I really, really don't. If you can do things to modify them, uh, to give them some kind of cooling period, then by all means, why not try it? You know, it just doesn't seem to be something that works long term. Uh, because the other thing of it is some people that, you know, again, just using Florida as an example, well, you, you know, let, put them in a cooler for six months. Fine. You could put them in a cooler for six months. You're probably not going to really be able to get it as cold as they actually need it to be. And two, how are you going to provide the gradual cool down? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the tricky part. You can't just take them from 80 degrees and throw them into 40. You know, they got to they gotta expel their guts. They got, you know, the whole nine. Um, and they stay so active even in those right? temperatures that in a cooler, they don't have the space to be active. You give 40 degrees to a Blanding's turtle, it's going to laugh at you. You know what I mean? And probably ask you for something to eat. More importantly, if you have a talking Blanding's turtle, call me. But um, <laughs> that brings me real quick to just a quick shameless plug I, I want to do. I actually have four articles out right now. Two of them are in Radiata Magazine. Um, I highly suggest any serious enthusiast to get Radiata Magazine. It's a German journal, but it does come in English. You can subscribe. Um, the issue out right now actually has an article from both me and Anthony. Anthony's article is on spotted turtles. Mine is on the annual cycle of both wood and Blanding's turtles. And it talks about their marriage to the cold weather and how important it is. So for anybody that's interested in that, that's a great, I, I personally am proud of that. I think it's a great read. Um, and then uh, the May issue of Radiata has a, a nice article about Western Hermit's tortoises and my genetic work with them. Uh, and then I have the Quang Tung River Turtle article is out in Reptiles right now. And the previous Reptiles uh, magazine issue has the Egyptian tortoise article, which is great for people that, again, are looking for that perfect indoor tortoise, something small that they can manage. So, Quang Tung River Turtle. Quang Tung River Turtle. Very cool. Are they from the bayou? Bye. How do you like those guys? They're cool. I like them a lot. I, I like them in Reeves turtles, though. I, I think you know Reeves are a lot of fun. They're a very underrated turtle. You know, mm -hmm. another one that is, is it's actually very inexpensive and not too large. I mean, I have the Japanese <coughs> variety, which is much bigger, but the Chinese variety is is significantly smaller. So, mm -hmm. and and readily available. I saw some at Hamburg. When was Hamburg? Last week? Week before? Oh, there were some there. Two weeks ago. Yeah, there, there were, were there were babies for like twenty. Chinese, you know, the Chinese variety, the brown ones. Right. Yeah. Okay. Twenty dollars, I think, for hatchlings. Twenty dollar reef turtle. Yep. yep. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we'll check on the poll to see uh, if you guys knew <laughs> that the Western Herman's tortoise had a stud book. And we had zero responses. Zero responses. <laughs> so I was right. Uh, I was right. Zero no responses one knew. either way. No one responded to us and let us know that they knew. Or didn't know. 
Anthony was right again. Simple Simple statistics. statistics. Yeah. Batting a thousand right now. You're going, who cares, Anthony? Take your shirt off. (laughs) Uh, Hold on. The situation. (laughs) Situation 2.0. Looking for wood turtles. The podcast uh, is getting a little hairy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Woo. Looking for um, uh, map turtles with Maurice. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Got to make sure that happens. <laughs> yeah. So That's do we it. have any final species? To, no. To li- okay. Sorry. That was every single turtle species on the planet. Um, they're going to get some bad feedback on that one, man. Fact. I, I, you I know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think this is a good place to wrap up. Great episode tonight. We've already got a lot of great feedback. Um Let's uh, let's do this again. Let's do this again. This was this was good. Let's do a thirty-six one. I wasn't sure. I was on the fence. I say, you know what? <laughs> let's have Chris on and help us decide if we should keep this going. Let's we'll go for thirty-six next month, and I want all you viewers to be there to usher it right. in. I'm making a promise now. I'll be on it. Oh man! Whoa! Oh, that's... You're going to come back next month. I'm going to come back next month. And my, all right, I'm going to I'm I'm know more about turtles. <laughs> I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Just viewers, just so everyone knows, Chris doesn't decide who's on the podcast. He has oh. to be invited. He wasn't invited yet. He's like, consider all guests vampires. They well, I can watch. I don't have in. to speak. I can watch. <laughs> yeah, but you never do. I, oh. <laughs> oh man, joking. that's how you're going to leave me? Dang. Oh. Dang. Okay, everyone, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, episode 36 will be on Monday, June 5th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And as always, you can uh, you know watch this later on YouTube. You can watch or listen. You can watch several of the previous 34 episodes before this one on YouTube. Some of them are only available on audio via our website or iTunes. Um, but anyway, so great night. Uh, we'll be back with you in another uh, five weeks, thanks to May having five Mondays. So uh, for Anthony and Chris, I'm Steve, and we're out. Thanks, guys.